standing order 108 bracket two and the motion adopted by the committee on Thursday, June 8th, 2023. The committee's meeting to discuss the impact of inflation and interest rates on mortgages in Canada. Today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format pursuant to the House order of June 23rd, 2022. Members are attending in person in the room and remotely using the Zoom application. I'd like to make a few comments for the benefit of the witnesses and members. Please wait until I recognize you by name before speaking. For those participating by video conference, click on the microphone icon to activate your mic. And please, please mute yourself when you are not speaking. Interpretation for those on Zoom, you have the choice at the bottom of your screen of either floor, English, or French. For those in the room, you can use the earpiece and select the desired channel. A reminder that all comments should be addressed through the chair. For members in the room, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand. For members on Zoom, please use the raise hand function. The clerk and I will manage the speaking order as best we can, and we appreciate your patience and understanding in this regard. Just for uh, a housekeeping uh, item here, we did uh, distribute a budget for uh, for this meeting. I hope all members received that, and uh, just to see if we could adopt that budget before we uh, get going. It was for $7,350. If I could just see a thumbs up from everybody. Okay, great. Okay, it's adopted. So now I'd like to welcome our witnesses and with us today from the Department of Finance, we have Matthew Mday, and he's the Senior Director, Demand and Labor Analysis, Economic Analysis, Forecasting Division, Economic Policy Branch. We have Rachel, Rachel Grasham, uh, Senior Director, Housing, Finance, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Division, Financial Sector Policy Branch, and Robert Sample, who's the Director General of Financial Stability and Capital Markets Division, Financial Sector Policy Branch. And also we've got Julie Turcott with us, who's the Acting Associate Assistant Deputy Minister, Economic Policy Branch. My understanding is that Mr. Sample will uh, give some opening introductory remarks and uh, for, the, uh, for the group, and then we will get to, uh, to members' questions. Mr. Sample. Thank you very much. You can hear me okay? Okay. We can. Bonjour. Uh, we are pleased to uh, be here to speak with you today and a couple of opening remarks on behalf of uh, the department, my colleague Julie, Rachel, and Matt. Um, so we're here to help you with your study on the impacts of inflation and increased interest rates on mortgages in Canada, particularly with respect to variable rate mortgages. <clears throat> These are important issues from a consumer and housing affordability perspective, and also from an economic resiliency, prudential and financial stability perspective. The department is actively monitoring this issue, as well as broader housing market developments. We are working with federal financial sector agencies who have a role in housing finance, consumer, prudential and financial stability issues. This includes the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, or OSFI, as the independent prudential banking regulator, the Bank of Canada, which includes its responsibility for monetary policy and financial stability, as well as the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, or the FCAC, from uh, a consumer protection perspective, and also the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, or CMHC, given its role as a mortgage insurer and its broader responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis housing affordability in Canada. There are a number of recent public documents I will point the committee's attention to that are germane to your study. So one is OS that OSFI recently undertook a public consultation on its mortgage under underwriting guideline B20. Next, the FCAC recently concluded consultations on a new guideline on mortgage hardship. And also the Bank of Canada recently issued its financial system review, which it does annually on current vulnerabilities, including with respect to households and the housing market. I understand that our federal partners and, financial, and Canadian financial institutions have been asked to appear before this committee and will be able to provide you with more detailed information with respect to their areas of interest and accountability. I can, however, offer some context on, mortgage, on the mortgage underwriting framework uh, to help frame our discussion and some issues that I understand are of interest to this committee. First. There are different roles in regulation and oversight between what are insured and uninsured mortgage markets. For the insured mortgage market, under the Bank of Canada, 
uh, sorry, under the Bank Act, mortgages originated by a federally regulated financial institution with less than 20% down payment are required to have mortgage default insurance. The Minister of Finance sets the minimum un underwriting rules for mortgage default insurance eligibility. These include the minimum qualifying rate, minimum down payment, minimum credit score, and maximum debt service ratio and amortization limits. These requirements are set out in regulations. Mortgage default insurance is guaranteed by the Government of Canada. The support allows borrowers to purchase a house with a lower down payment and typically at lower interest rates. The maximum amortization period for an insured mortgage is currently 25 years. For uninsured mortgages, Aussie's guideline B20 sets out expectations for prudent residential mortgage underwriting. Guideline B20 is applicable to all federally regulated financial institutions engaged in residential mortgage underwriting and or the acquisition of residential mortgage loan assets in Canada. As noted, OSFI is currently reviewing Guideline B20. I'd like to draw your attention to that the, the, there are other prudential rules overseen by OSFI uh, that also play a role, including bank, bank capital requirements and OSFI supervision approach with the institutions it oversees. One specific rule I should highlight is that borrowers applying for either an insured uh, a rule made by the Minister of Finance or an uninsured mortgage rules under the bailiwick of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions must qualify under the minimum qualifying rate. Currently, that is the greater of the borrower's contract rate plus 200 basis points or a minimum floor rate of 5.25%. The minimum qualifying rate increases borrower resiliency and reduces vulnerabilities associated with high household debt and risk to financial stability by better positioning borrowers to be able to make their mortgage payments as interest or other expenses rise, or if there is a loss of income due to personal circumstances. Going one step further with respect to the committee study, with respect to variable rate mortgages, since the increase in interest rates from March 2022, lender and borrower risks associated with variable rate mortgage products and renewals have increased. While the majority of Canadians still opt for a five-year fixed mortgage, fixed rate mortgage, the number of Canadians taking on a variable rate mortgage increased as interest rates were rising. This is now abated at current interest rates. There are two types of variable rate mortgages, an adjustable rate mortgage and a fixed payment variable rate mortgage. So just a bit of background here for your study. <clears throat> With an adjustable rate mortgage, the borrower's payment automatically increases or decreases as interest rates rise or fall. With a fixed payment variable rate mortgage, the borrower's payment remains constant, but the portion going to interest versus principal varies as interest rates change. With fixed payment variable rate mortgages, if the interest rate rises during the borrower's term, the amortization period can be extended to keep the monthly payment fixed. Financial institutions have policies that guide this. Another uh, and a final uh, point of emphasis in my opening remarks are that our current understanding is that many homeowners are in a financial position to manage rising interest rates and are increasing monthly payments. However, for some borrowers, lenders may need to explore flexibility depending on borrower circumstances and the, the degree of hardship. Our understanding is that lenders have been proactively reaching out to, to customers on this matter to present options to help manage the situation on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you very much and my colleagues and I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have or point you to the appropriate stakeholder that could answer uh, your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Sample, for those opening re remarks. We are going to get into our first round of questions. I am going to ask in our, in our first round if uh, witnesses, those that are uh, most uh, appropriate to answer the the members' questions, if you could just uh, uh, repeat your your name and if uh, and uh, the department that uh, that you represent. So, uh, starting on our first round, each uh, party will have up to six minutes for questions. We are starting with the Conservatives, and I have uh, MP Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Sample. If it's all right with you, I'll direct my questions uh, and you can parcel them out as you wish. Uh, many lenders, all lenders don't have the fixed 
uh, fixed payment variable term mortgage, right, as you, as you discussed. Those that do, uh, my understanding is that even while you may be a borrower could be in a negative amortization experience now, i.e. you're adding uh, to the principal every month th that you owe, that upon <laughs> renewal, the way that the mortgage market works, you need to go back to the original amortization period when you signed your mortgage. For example, if you signed a 25-year mortgage, when you renew at year 20, you actually have to amortize what you owe on the 20, not on 25 and not on 30, without, if you don't want to shop and requalify and go to another institution. Is that, do I have that about right? I, I do think, generally speaking, you know, different, there are different policies across different institutions, internal policies. Generally speaking, uh, that is what we've heard. Um, but I would like to caveat that with the fact that the institutions will be working with borrowers, and if there were a hardship case in getting back to original amortization, the expectation uh, would be that um, you know, they might be able to do work out a refinance or some other uh, mortgage flexibility option. If, if there was a circumstance where the borrower just couldn't make the payment, the, the, the higher payments at that time. That's fair. My, my understanding is, though, if you do not accept the original amortization term that you need to requalify, and I think this is where we're going to get into a problem, because if, the, if, the house, if a house price falls and you need to requalify and it requires an appraisal, or for whatever reason your financial and situation changes. My understanding is the rule for OSFI, and I understand this to be a good question to ask OSFI, is that you you need to requalify on the B20 guidelines. So interested in learning more about that, but appreciate it. Do you, the mortgage, the percentage of mortgages that are actually over 35 years in amortization now have actually jumped substantially from 0% just a year ago to some institutions that have 25-30% of their mortgage book now over 35 years. Do we know or does finance know how many of those mortgages are insured? Of the 35, yeah, of the 25% say that are over 35 year amortization at an institution, how many of those are insured? Uh, I'm not sure that we have that statistics okay. with us today. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, it would be an interesting stat, I would think, those who are looking at the space would want to know. Yeah, what I, just to kind of lead yeah. into this, so uh, generally speaking, you know, the larger share of mortgage originations, new mortgage originations in Canada is uninsured, so a down payment, uh, uninsured, yeah, down payment more than 20%. So I, the other, of those who have had amortizations extended, do we know how many of them are principal residences <coughs> or investment properties? Uh, these are detailed questions that we'd have to get back to you on. What, okay. I, what I can say is for insured mortgages, investment properties are prohibited. Okay. Very interested in the answer to the second question. If we are allowing, we as in the government, the country, a society, if we are allowing investors to stretch out amortization periods because they cannot meet the obligations under a financial hardship, I'm not really sure that's a public policy decision that everyone would, would agree with. So I, if you did have some information on that, I would certainly appreciate it. I think some of my other colleagues would at this table about the level of investment activity in the residential real estate market is, from my understanding, quite high historically. Um, that would be a data point would be very helpful for us as we think about recommendations to the government on policies about who we might help, who we might not help, who deserves help, who doesn't deserve help. Uh, these are going to be tricky conversations, so the data we get from some of that will be very helpful. Um, why don't we have a 10-year mortgage product in Canada? Why is, why is there not a functioning 10-year market? If everybody believes the government's 
line and the Bank of Canada's line that interest rates are going to come down and inflation is going to come down. The most popular product in the U.S. is a 30-year fixed rate, fixed payment term mortgage. There's no renegotiations. I, I, I'm having a really hard time understanding, like, is this something that the department's looked at? You know, how come we don't have a 10-year product? You could blend and extend some of these folks. That's how you could get over a little bit of a hump. Technically, the 10-year rate should be below what the five-year rate is right now. The yield curve's inverted. Is there a reason why Canada doesn't have a well-functioning, longer-term product? It, thank you for the question. Um, that is something that's been asked over, over time and been looked into. I think that there's some legal parameters around that that might influence that, including, um, and first off, I should say that there are 10-year products uh, offered by some institutions, so it's not prohibited or not that it exists, but I believe Provincial Interest Act requirements also play in. I don't have the specifics uh, on me in terms of like how that manifests itself, but there are some, uh, some legal uh, conditions that might guide why there's uh, fewer 10-year mortgages than... than I, I'm just going to jump in because I'm you. out, I'm out of my time, yeah. but if, yeah. if you had a study that you had produced in the last little while, as, or, or if you looked at it, if you could provide any research to the committee, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I, I can just you. add to that. And that Thank is, you, MP Chambers. No, we're sorry. out of time, actually, for, for MP Chambers, but, may, but with the study, if, if uh, officials are able to do that, if you do have something, please, uh, please... Uh, Submitted to the committee. Uh, we're moving to uh, the Liberals and MP Baker, please. Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you all for, for being here today. Um, one of the things I hear about from my constituents in Etobicoke Centre is that um, is this issue of how rising interest rates are impacting their mortgage servicing costs. Um, have we seen, can you talk a little bit about, and I think the biggest fear, is there's, there's, so there's going to be an increase in, in, in interest costs that people are going to have to have to pay if they have a variable rate mortgage, but then there's the, the concern about the, the worst case outcome, which is delinquencies, people not being able to pay their mortgages, people having to sell their homes, things like that. Um, have we seen an increase in delinquencies since interest rates started climbing? To answer that specific question, I believe that uh, arrears remain uh, close to pre t pre pandemic levels. But Matt, uh, MD, or Julie, would you? Sure. Sorry. Sorry. Hey, Matt, MD. Um, yeah, uh, mortgage arrears in particular um, are remain very low. So pretty much near like all time lows. There's different metrics of it, but the Bank of Canada publishes some data um, publicly. And in the first quarter of this year, 0.12% um, of mortgages were in arrears, um, well below kind of the pre-pandemic 25 to 29, sorry, 2015 to 2019 average of 0.23. So no evidence so far of mortgage arrears rising. Um, why, why is that? Well, there's a number of factors. One is that um, household finances overall are fairly healthy. Um, they uh, benefited from um, strong income, strong labour markets over the past few years, um, a build-up of savings, um, strong asset price growth um, uh, by a lot of metrics household balance sheets are in better shape than they were pre-pandemic um, so that's helping households handle um, the impact of elevated inflation elevated interest rates the other thing i'd say though is there is evidence that arrears rates have been rising in other credit products uh, credit cards auto loans installment loans They've all been creeping up lately. They're still at relatively low levels, kind of at 2019 levels. So, I mean, this is what we typically see is when households are under financial pressure, they prioritize their mortgage payment above all else, right? That's the last thing you'll see an increase in is mortgage arrears. Everything else happens first. They, they increase credit card borrowing. They maybe go delinquent on credit card. So it's not surprising to us that 
we've seen no action at all in mortgage years so far. And so, so what I'm hearing you say is mortgage delinquencies, mortgage arrears are lower than they were pre-pandemic, but other forms of loans, and you cited credit card, credit card debt, um, or auto loans as examples. In those particular cases, what I heard you say is the uh, arrears, so in other words, people making late payment, I assume is what you mean by arrears, um, that, that figure has increased, uh, sorry, that figure is close, to, is similar to 2019 levels. Is that what I heard you say? That's right. Okay. And so, so and the reason I heard you say that I'm, I'm, is that you said, what I heard you say was you talked about people, you talked about the labor market being strong, incomes rising, and um, that people had strong balance sheets. For the folks at home, when, like I have a financial background and I studied accounting and I know what, what it means when people say I have a strong balance sheet, but, but for folks at home who are watching this, when you say they have a strong balance sheet, what, what, what does that mean? Sure. So some of the things that, that I'd point to, um, net wealth, um, so you know, asset minus debt, um, household net wealth um, as a share of income is well above its pre-pandemic level. Um, and in particular, um, uh, housing equity, so like the share of uh, your home value, kind of subtracting out the debt you owe on your home. Um, that uh, home equity level is at uh, high levels as well, higher than his history, higher than pre-pandemic. Um, other kind of broader measures like debt to asset ratio, which is kind of a measure of leverage, is also lower than pre-pandemic levels. So those are the, the positives. It, it's kind of tempered by the fact that um, the debt to income ratio, which is a kind of a often cited metric, is kind of at slightly above pre-pandemic levels. So it's, it's been elevated for a number of years. Um, those are some of the, the key metrics we look at in, in terms of balance sheets. Okay. okay. How much time do I have, Mr. Chair? Got uh, about 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. So I won't have time for another question. I'd love to ask. I'm sure my colleagues will ask some great questions. But I, I think what I'm hearing you say is people's net, in your, in your last response, was people's net wealth is higher on average. This doesn't apply to every individual. But on average, Canadians' net wealth is higher than it was pre-pandemic, which means they've been able to better with, and incomes are up compared to that time, the labor market is strong. So people are able to withstand some of the higher interest rates more than they would have been if that hadn't been the case. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, correct. Okay. And so, got it. So that doesn't mean folks aren't struggling. There aren't folks out there who aren't struggling. There aren't, that doesn't mean people aren't having a tough time. I know they are because they speak to me about it. But what it seems to indicate is that people, Canadians have built up the savings, or a lot of Canadians have built up the savings or have higher incomes and to be able to cope with higher interest rates. And from my perspective, that means those folks who can't or haven't had higher incomes or are struggling, those are the folks we need to focus on to help them get through this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, MP Baker. And uh, now we're moving to the block. And uh, MP Samari, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, to the four of you for being here today. As you can see, this is a subject that is of great concern to us. The rise in costs with the rising interest rates is much of concern. Adam raised the issue of uh, mortgages that are over a longer amortization period than 25 years, and that concerns me a great deal because the, it, this monthly cost to the household, if, if you allow people to put it over 25 years to 30, 35 years, it's a small, um, it helps in the short term, but it increases the long-term program. So in Japan, you can pay back a mortgage over three generations. I would say I don't want to live in that society. So I have a lot of questions for you. The first concerns, the uh, CMHC program, the incentive for the purchase of a first um, property. I used that a few years back myself, uh, in fact, a couple of decades back. But with the rising costs of um, loan borrowing, have you seen an increase in the use of that program? Or has there been a decrease? Or is it stable? So how is that working? Thank you. Merci pour la question. Je pense Thank you for the question. I think that it is the incentive, uh, that program. And 
I don't have the statistics with me but uh, that I can share today, but uh, it's probably a good question for the CMHC if there have been any changes in the use of that program. Okay, thank you. So if ever you have any information on that to send us uh, as a follow-up, uh, if not, we'll invite the CMHC in July. Huh. So in your department, have you quantified the impact on the market for the different federal programs in terms of housing? So there are a lot of announces, announcements rather made by the federal government. But have you quantified that? Merci pour la question. Thank you for the question. It would probably, uh, I probably need to have the specific program names and to have that information. Well, in fact, I'm talking on a macro level. All of the various programs that the federal government uh, has announced, whether it, for building new housing, whether it's affordable or whatever, have you in your provisions or projections seen this? If, has this really solved the problem of accessibility to housing? Have, have you studied that globally? Well, if I can make a comment on that comment, it's very difficult to do because some policies, for example, target improving regulations to speed up what's available. It, so it's difficult. What the government has said in the last budget is that they were trying to double what uh, housing is available by 2035. So there are various policies put into place with a, a, a macro perspective. So you can say that while some people are having trouble having access to housing, and how can we help them in terms of what's available? We need to accelerate housing starts and the construction of new housing. So there are some policies on that as well. So it's really difficult to quantify globally the impact of those measures. But the objective remains to double the available housing by 2035. Okay, thank you very much. That's very interesting. I'll come back to that. What it concerns us as well is the labor shortage in construction, the rising cost of materials. So do policies that have been announced up until now, given that new reality of sh labor shortages and higher costs of, if has what's been put in place enough to really double the available housing by 2035 as announced. Well, I come back to the same point that I said earlier. It's difficult to quantify the global impact of these policies. It's very true that the labor market is really tight right now. It's tough to find um, workers. However, there's a lot of development in terms of changing regulations in order to um, have more density in housing. And so uh, there can be a lot of progress made in terms of the regulations. What we've seen for housing starts also recently is that they've remained relatively solid. Um, and by comparison with the pre-pandemic period. There was a slowdown recently, and um, that's not, not unusual when there's a slowdown in the market. Thank you. It's very interesting. I've um, learned to listen to non-answers in your answers uh, over the past few years here. Another subject, those who have less flexibility to buy a house are those who pay the most for the rising in, in rising rates on variable mortgages. So according to what we see and hear is that those have the who have variable rate mortgages are mainly first time buyers and young people. So is that what you're seeing as well? We don't have the data to answer that question, but I think it would be best to ask the Bank of Canada or OSFI. Okay. 
I have many more questions, Mr. Chairman. What's, you're, you're, you're cutting me off once again. Sounds so empty, somebody, but uh, great questions and answers. Uh, so we're going now to the NDP and uh, MP Blakey, please. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And just before I begin, I'd like to move closer to the mic, <laughs> which is uh, a much more comfortable position. And I want to ask, um, like, I think, I, I guess I want to assess the extent to which we're in a bit of a, a structural quandary, because we've heard the governor of the Bank of Canada has said that his intention is to raise interest rates, in part at least, to try and cool off the housing market. And so we've seen, and, I, and I'm glad to see, Canadians who really are struggling with the cost of uh, housing see some relief and see financial institutions try and provide relief. But I guess the, the structural trap seems to be that as long as financial institutions are mitigating the impact on Canadians who would struggle to pay their mortgage, like increasing their, effectively increasing their amortization um, through applying, you know, through, through the fixed interest uh, or fixed payment mortgages, essentially just extending the amortization to make up for the fact that that payment no longer covers any of the uh, principal or even all the interest, that then the conclusion that the Bank uh, of Canada draws is that they need to increase interest rates further because they're not seeing the cooling effect that they that they had anticipated in the absence of those measures. So, you know, as policymakers, how do how should we try to understand that structural problem? And and what do you think are some solutions to try and get out of that trap uh, and support Canadians in maintaining their homes? I can thank you for the question. Um, what I can say is that monetary policy is an independent decision of the of the governor of the Bank of Canada and the governing council. Um, but on all the other policies that are put in place, for example, um, uh, decisions that the superintendent's taking around mortgage underwriting or capital requirements or, um, you know, if the Minister of Finance were to adjust something or the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada were to adjust something, that there is... Court, I want there is a sharing of information amongst those agencies, so um, I would put the monetary policy decision to the side, but generally speaking on you know adjustments to rules or analysis that's being prepared by the superintendent of financial institutions that's shared with all those regulatory agencies at the highest level in a, in a body that's called the Financial Institution Supervisory Committee, and the Deputy Minister of Finance also chairs a senior advisory committee on financial sector policy matters including the issues that uh, are being discussed today where, you know, the, the principles of those agencies are there. So these things are discussed. Um, I have no doubt that they're discussed, and I'm not suggesting that government should try and set monetary policy, but just as the bank, you know, for, forecasts things about government fiscal policy and, and takes an interest in government's fiscal documents when setting their policy, surely government looks at what the Bank of Canada is saying and its own reporting out on its own policy making, the factors that influence its decisions, and then incorporates that, I would hope, into its own fiscal policy making. Not because the two are the same, not because it's the job of the government to set monetary policy, but because it has to create its fiscal policy with some awareness of what the monetary policy situation is. And so in a context, which we seem to be in, where the Bank of Canada wants to reduce prices in the housing market and we see banks moving to try and uh, you know rightly help Canadians but that that has an effect of slowing price decreases in the housing market what kind of fiscal policy could help Canadians that are stuck in this trap so that we don't see persistently climbing interest rates cause more Canadians to find that their mortgages are in jeopardy because interest rates have gone higher like it seems to me we're we're caught. We don't want more Canadians to be in a difficult position than already are, and we don't want the folks that are already in a difficult position to be sacrificed on the altar of getting Canada's housing bubble under control. So what are some fiscal policy ideas that government has looked at that might mitigate that difficult trap that we seem to find ourselves in? Just jump in. Sorry, just one, one uh, thank you for the question, just one uh, point to make before I think my colleague Julie will have more more to say. 
But, I, you know, in terms of monitoring the situation um, of how actually these uh, cases, these variable rate mortgage, and there, are, there will be an issue that, and that is being managed with fixed rate mortgages as well. Um, so those mortgages that were taken out in 2021, if they're five-year fixed, uh, there, there could be a payment increase uh, five years down the road from that. So that is coming up as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's early days, but OSFI is monitoring how financial institutions are managing uh, these cases. There is some, and please do direct your questions to OSFI on this, but there is some evidence that, you know, a number of, uh, a number of borrowers are increasing uh, their payments. Um, and, you know, some will be seeking hardship relief and, and other things, but there seems to be some... Uh, definitely some borrowers that are choosing to increase their monthly payments and are able to manage that, and that, that kind of draws on the points that my colleague Matt was making about the financial position of Canadians. So I, this is early days and something that requires further monitoring, but just wanted to make that point. And Julie, if you... Um, yes, maybe like a broader uh, context here. Um, I mean, I am, I'm not sure I would qualify like as a structural trap, I mean, like you said, you now we have interest rates uh, risen rapidly, have mortgage costs that are up. And of course, it's going to squeeze household budgets and, and slow uh, consumption. And we have seen uh, some of that. If you look at uh, consumption adjusted for population growth, or so what we call consumption per capita basis, uh, has really plateaued and has not uh, increased much. So. I mean, households are coping with you know, these higher uh, interest rates, uh, as Matt said before, like in a you know, relatively good manner uh, because the labor markets remain strong. Household balance sheets are also uh, you know, quite healthy. Um, so obviously over time, this will help to slow inflation and you know, will allow for some uh, normalization also in interest rates. So that's... Uh, part of the process. Um, so, and, and with regards to the, you know, the extending the, the maximum allowable amortization, I think it's you no, know, it it seems as a you know release valve, right? Because you have some maybe temporary increase in payments, uh, some difficulties to cope. So it's you no, know, this is a, a real, real uh, temporary valve, thank not you. a structural one. And, and that, uh, members, thank you very much, our witness, and to MP Blakey. And that concludes our, our first round. We're into our second round now, and uh, I have uh, MP Lawrence up next for five minutes. Thank you uh, very much. Appreciate you being here today. I think this is a, a very serious subject. Of course, Canada is the most uh, indebted nation in the in the G7. Consumer debt is both in popular med media and in, in academic writings and a, a very serious issue. And uh, I, uh, I, I give you uh, all my best in trying to, to manage this uh, situation as we go forward. Just a couple of questions for you. I want to take this uh, at a fairly high level. Um, if you had to, look, if you looked at the mortgage market right now in Canada and you were looking at a green, everything is fine, it's good, uh, yellow, uh, for the most part is pretty good, but we have some concerns, or red, we've got some serious concerns, where would you put the Canadian mortgage market right now? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm not sure that I would color coded myself uh, at this point, but I could, uh, an entity that does is the Bank of Canada. Um, and so I point you to their financial system review and, and um, yes, Canadian household debt and house price matters have been uh, an important vulnerability to financial system stability in Canada for, uh, for a decade or more. Um, there has been a number of uh, measures taken uh, by successive governments to to manage this to try and manage this issue. So uh, I spoke to the mortgage insurance regulations. Um, there's been gradual, like a number of gradual steps uh, to tighten that er in that area over the uh, the last uh, the last decade. Um, and so there there has been steps taken. I can go into more detail if you'd like, but I won't well, at this time. That's fine. Um, Thank you. And then also in terms of the the prudential underwriting standards that the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Issues has put into place. Um, 
I think that's that's another element, which is that the the quality of the mortgages and the credit uh, the credit level of the uh, the borrower coming into the mortgage market today is a lot high a lot higher standard than it was a decade ago. Thank you. Um, would your level of concern increase if interest rates went up by, say, two percent? Um, OSFI's guideline already stressed it, uh, mortgage at 2% rate differential, right? It, so that the idea was to ensure that households can uh, cope and you know, be resilient. But, but, sorry, Ms. Turcotte, those, those have, those, some of those mortgages might have been tested with a 2% increase when, in, when interest rates were 3% lower, um, right? And so if they went 2% higher, uh, and their existing mortgages that might have been stress tested at three or four percent, and now they're at five or six or seven or eight percent. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. I, I would think you'd be concerned. Uh, yes, rising interest rates is, from a financial system perspective, is is. Uh, could could raise difficult issues uh, if interest rates were to move to higher levels. Certainly for those borrowers that currently have mortgages, and I think you've made a good point, which is that uh, there. And what Julie was trying to um, to emphasize is that for new borrowers coming in, th there is this stress test or this minimum qualifying rate, which provides some protection. But definitely, this is a, a larger a large interest rate increase for a number of borrowers um, at current levels. As I mentioned before, what we're seeing is there are, there is there are borrowers that are managing the payments, the the payment increases. Uh, thank you, thank uh, yeah. thank you, uh, um, and uh, uh, very much appreciating your testimony. The is there a tipping point where you would be, whichever adjective you wish, very significantly or otherwise concerned? What what interest rate would it be at a uh, at six, eight, ten? Um, I assume that these numbers exist, uh, and uh, if, if you would be kind enough to share them and table them with the committee, we'd be greatly appreciative. So if you, will, you promote, that, will you table those documents? Um, we can take that back. Uh, happy to table anything that we have that would be of use to the committee. Okay, so thank you. And Thank you, MP Lawrence, and to officials. And uh, now we are moving to the Liberals and MP Zerowitz, please. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank um, our presenters today. This is an important topic, and the information you're providing is excellent. In February 2020, um, our then uh, Minister of Finance introduced um, a more difficult stress test. Um, do you believe that the, the measure that we introduced then has actually contributed to the low delinquency rate that we are seeing right now. Um, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, prudent underwriting standards uh, means that borrowers that become homeowners can withstand shocks, uh, income shocks, interest rate shocks, uh, personal issues that might arise in their family circumstances. The minimum qualifying rate, or the stress test as you refer to it, is, is one measure uh, that was uh, put in place with a, a floor of 5.25% at the time and a 2% buffer above the, uh, the contract rate. It, that has been helpful in mitigating, um, mitigating issues, uh, but it doesn't work, work alone. There are other standards in place that also help uh, the financial system for financial system stability and borrower stability, such as da minimum down payment requirements, um, maximum amortization limits. I'm speaking about the insured mortgage rules at this point, uh, and debt service ratio uh, limits and credit minimum credit score requirements. So there are a number of rules in place uh, for insured mortgages that are helping. Similarly, with um, with uninsured mortgages, uh, the the focus of the superintendent of financial institution and his office on this matter over the last 
number of years uh, certainly will be helping, uh, has helped uh, mitigate potential issues in this area. I can't quantify that. But. Which is which is okay. I just yeah. want to make sure that, that the public re is reminded a number of measures were put into place to actually build some resiliency uh, into uh, mortgages. And so it wasn't it, it became more difficult for mortgages to default. And so those measures have actually helped. Um, I just want a couple basic facts. Um, what percentage of residential mortgages are variable rate versus um, fixed? Do you know? Just qu quickly. Uh, yeah, I have those statistics. Um, the, the Bank of Canada and their financial system review has that publicly. So as of... Um, February 2023, um, the share of mortgages, the share of the stock of mortgage that had variable rate variable payments was 9%. The share that had variable rate fixed payments was 17%, and then the rest were fixed like, rate Like 80% uh, sort of fixed and then 20% variable? Like, do you have that number? Right, so if we add up the two variable shares I gave you, 17 plus 9 is 26. So okay. it's like 26% is variable rate. Yeah. And so like, yeah, three quarters is fixed. Okay, rate. and then what percentage of mortgages have increased their amortization up here beyond 25 years since 2021? So those data we don't have. Um, different financial institutions have released some of this data just in their regulatory filings. Um, so it, it's just kind of publicly So it'll be a question I'll ask the financial institutions if they come here. Thank you. Um, so it is true that we have been hearing that Canada has the largest debt levels, probably of all sort of G7 or OECD countries. Um, I don't know what is the data, but I know that we've been told we have large debt levels. You've told us today that household finances are relatively healthy and we have strong balance sheets. I would love to know if someone could respond to, if we have high debt levels, what percentage of that is equity, so sort of housing equity, and does that make it um, less of a worry in terms of high debt levels? Can someone maybe respond to that? So there's a two-part question. Of the high debt levels that apparently we have in this country, is a lot of it home equity, like sort of like what we owe? And then does that make it a healthier type of high debt level? If you, can, if you could respond to that. Yeah, thank you for your question. I, I and could you speak up, please? I can barely hear you. Uh, Monsieur Saint-Marie, I could barely hear my hair. If I could, uh, if, if you sure. could uh, just stop talking. Thank uh, you. I believe about 80% of household debt is mortgages. Um, so to the extent that you think of that debt is different than other debt because it's linked to an asset that appreciates. Um, yeah, I think w what you're suggesting is, is reasonable. Um, that doesn't mean it's all... S I barely hear you. Please speak up. That, that doesn't mean, obviously, okay. that there's yeah. no risks involved with yeah. housing debt and housing assets. House prices can fall, right? And that's the time. Uh, but thank you, MP at Zerowitz. And uh, now we're to uh, the block and MP Samari for two and a half minutes. Merci, monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And my first of all, my uh, apologies to Julie. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I was chatting with, with, uh, the, with the Daniel while he was speaking, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry. As I only have two and a half minutes, I'll ask you two uh, questions uh, right off the bat. First of all, with the increase in interest rates, do you think that there will be more houses and condos uh, being purchased? Do you think you'll see a decrease in prices? So if so, what breakdown would you make of that? That's the first question. Second... Do you have an estimate of personal bankruptcies uh, that might be related to the increase in, in, in mortgage um, rates? And I'm sorry once again, Judy. Merci pour la question. Thank you for the question. In the end, yes, there's clearly a connection between the increase in interest rates and housing costs for prices. We've already seen the prices go down some 15 to 16 percent 
between the beginning of 2022 until the spring, this spring. So that's already happened. But it seems that the housing market has found a balance and recent data indicates that uh, there's a rebound. So it's not clear whether or not we will see more decreases in housing prices. And for the increase in personal bankruptcies, I already discussed the, the data about consumer insolvencies. That's more or less the same thing. And I'm told that the delinquencies have gone up in recent months, but the level is still similar to 2000, well, before the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. St. Marie. Members, the uh, the clerk has asked for the sound to be increased, uh, and also, if members can use their earpieces and the sound in the the chatter or whatever is happening within the room, it does affect the interpreters. Is uh, is what I've understood. So, if people could just keep it down a little bit, and use your earpieces if you can hear better, and we have increased the sound. So, on that, we're going to the NDP and MP Blakey. Thank you very very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, with the time that I have presently, I would like to move a motion that I gave notice of last day, which is that Vice Chair Halan no longer has the confidence of the Standing Committee on Finance, and as a result that we proceed immediately to the election of a new Vice Chair from the official opposition. And I just want to give a little bit of context for this. Um, members may not know, and Canadians watching may not know, that Vice chairs of committees receive an extra $6,000, $6,600 a year for the work that they're meant to do for the sake of a committee. And members around this table will know that the Finance Committee has been meeting a lot over the last number of weeks. And we had over 40 hours of filibuster on the Budget Implementation Act. And what I found remarkable about that process, among other things, and I have given my thoughts on the record before about the nature and the reasons for the for the for the filibuster was the absence of the vice chair during those uh, proceedings. Of course, he was here for some of the time, but not all of the time. The principal formal duty of a vice chair is to be available in the event that the chair can't chair. And sometimes that's when a chair can't come to the meeting. Sometimes it's because the chair has to excuse him or herself at various times for for various reasons and so that's the principal duty that a vice chair performs for the committee is to be present and to be available in order to relieve the chair in case that's required there's also informal roles that vice chairs play in terms of talking to other members of the committee um, talking to other recognized parties on the committee to try and find a way forward particularly when there's an impasse as there most definitely was in the case of the study of the Budget Implementation Act. Now, not all of the minutes of those meetings and all of the blues for those meetings are currently available because there was a lot of meeting and, uh, and how staff need time, even as they continue to support our committee and others, to be able to put that information up online. So not all the timestamps are there. But I, I think, Mr. Chair, you'll get an idea of the extent of Mr. Halan's participation in that study by just comparing, first of all, uh, the substitution list and the number of interventions. So when you look at comparable members, like the other vice chair for this committee, Monsieur Saint-Marie, uh, during the course of the study had two substitutions. Monsieur Mario Simard and Nathalie Sinclair de Gagné subbed in at various times for Monsieur Saint-Marie, Saint who nevertheless had about 115 interventions during the course of the study. I myself had two substitutions during the course of this study because it is the case that MPs from time to time have other legitimate parliamentary commitments that don't allow them to be at the table. Uh, Mr. Taylor Backrack and Mr. Brian Massey substituted in for me. I still managed to have about 169 interventions in the course of the Budget Implementation Act study. And Mr. Lawrence, who did a lot of work for Conservatives during the course of the study, including, I would say, the, for the informal role of vice chair. He played, he talked to 
other committee members. He was part and parcel of negotiating uh, those moments where we were able to make um, some happy progress in the study of the Budget Implementation Act. Mr. Lawrence had four substitutions. Uh, Kelly McCauley, Ben Lobb, Damian Couric, and Ed Fast all substituted in for Mr. Lawrence at some point. He managed to have 290 interventions in the Budget Implementation Act study, which gives you a sense of just how present Mr. Lawrence was and the work that he was doing <laughs> in trying to provide some leadership to the Conservative side. In the case of Mr. Halan, we saw he had 10 different substitutions. Karen Vecchio, Damian Couric, Mark Dalton, Michelle Ferreri, Carrie Lynn Finley, Cheryl Gallant, Garnet Genuis, Larry McGuire, Rick Perkins, and Arnold Viersen. And anyone who is listening to the proceedings will know that while I listed Rick Perkins as one name in a list of 10, uh, it was a very outsized contribution that Mr. Perkins made, uh, at least in respect of time, to the proceedings of the committee. And, and throughout the entire Budget Implementation Act study, Mr. Lawn had about 29 interventions. So if you look, that's almost exactly 10% 10, 10 of the interventions that Mr. Lawrence had. Now, again, I respect that MPs have a lot of things to do, and I respect that MPs can't always be at the committee table, and I myself have sometimes not been at the committee table. But I don't get paid $6,600 extra dollars a year to be here at the committee table to be able to relieve the chair. I haven't undertaken that responsibility. Conservatives themselves have recognized in the context of this parliament that sometimes their finance critic can't meet the obligations of vice, vice chair and therefore does not deserve the pay. For instance, when uh, Mr. Polyev himself was finance critic for the, Conservative Party's, for the Conservative Party and sat at this committee table, the vice chair was Greg McLean. And when Ed Fast was finance critic for the Conservative Party, the vice chair was Dan Albus. Because at that time, it was recognized that the person who's going to do the job of vice chair should be in the main here. And if they had a finance critic that was too busy doing other things, like trying to improve upon a lackluster question period performance or undermine the sitting leader or whatever it is that they're going to be doing when they're not at this table, right, and different ones have committed that time to different things, that they didn't accept the $6,600 for being the vice chair of the committee. So fair enough. I'm not here to dispute that MPs are busy people. I'm not here to dispute that we're not all trying to juggle a lot of different jobs. But I notice that in the past, conservatives, when their finance critic is too busy to do the job at this table, have asked somebody else to be vice chair. And I think that that is actually the right and proper way of doing that. And when I think, when you look at the statistics of interventions and substitutions over the course of the Budget Implementation Act, it's clear that Mr. Halan is too busy to be doing the job of vice chair with other things. I don't begrudge him those other things. It takes time to prepare a hagiographic hey podcast, for instance, so I know that he, he, he needs hours in the day. That's fine. But when I look at Mr. Lawrence and the amount that he invests around this committee table, even though it's not recognized by his leader, in trying to talk to other people and have a sense of a path forward for the committee, um, I think it's more befitting that Mr. Lawrence be the vice chair of this committee and receive the $6,600 because he's putting in the time and putting in the work. And I think it's important that when people accept additional salary that they do the additional work. And by and large, that is a work of presence particularly if you're going to do that job for a party that is going to cause a lot of extra meetings and a lot of extra time. We spent a lot of time listening to the interventions of Conservative members, including on the East Coast fishery. So be it. I respect the right of members to filibuster, but find it passing strange that Mr. Halan would be part and parcel of triggering some long non sequiturs here at this committee and then decide that those aren't worth his time but make the decision for the rest of us at this table that those interventions were worth our time. And I think it would have been an important act of leadership on his part to be here for the speeches that he argued were an important part of the Budget Implementation Act study. I may very well argue differently, in fact have, on the record in other places. It's his contention that those were important speeches for us to listen to. He ought to have been here to listen along with us. And I think the fact base clearly shows that he did not provide that leadership, but that Mr. Lawrence was here for those things, and Mr. Lawrence was accomplishing the role that Mr. Halan ought to be accomplishing. 
And so I think as a committee, we're not here to judge Mr. Lawn's role as finance critic. We're not here to judge his role as MP. We're not here to judge how he spends his time. But we are in a position to judge whether he's doing us a proper service as the vice chair and fulfilling those roles. I think we would be better served by the situation that conservatives have put in place before, where their, vice, where their finance critic is not the vice chair. Because there is someone here who's doing the work of vice chair. That person has made it a priority to be here. I don't doubt that Mr. Lawrence is busy with other things and that he has obligations to his riding, that he has obligations to his party, that he has to fulfill outside the context of this table. But he's nevertheless made it a priority at least to be here. Um, if nothing else, and I think that that is an important component of being the vice chair. So it's why I think this is an important item of committee business. I recognize we're getting ready to rise for the summer, uh, and I think it's important that we deal with this before we do. So that's why I'm bringing it forward uh, at this time, before there is no more time, in order to address this question before rising for the summer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, uh, MP Blakey, and I do have an extensive list here of MPs that want to speak. I've got Chatel, Beach, Lawrence, Baker, Zerowitz, Samari, Morantz. And I don't know if I see anybody else that would like to get on that speaking order. No? Just a point okay. of order, Mr. Chair. Yep. Yes. Uh, yes, MP uh, Chambers. Thank you. Um, since you have an extended list, uh, I don't know how long people's interventions tend to be. If they intend to talk out the rest of the meeting, that's totally fine by me, but I appreciate the fact that we have officials here uh, who've generously donated their time. Uh, I wouldn't ask anyone to change what they're going to say, but I would appreciate if we are going to talk out the rest of the meeting that we would uh, allow our officials to return uh, to their jobs uh, and okay. working on the things that uh, they need to do. Okay, thank you, MP Chambers. I can't presume what members are going to do, but uh, so we all will move into our speaking order first, and we'll just uh, hold officials uh, with us for the time being. So we're starting with uh, MP Chatel. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, listen, it's a bit strange to hear this from my colleague. <laughs> to say all of this, and um, I agree uh, that if we're going to spend the rest of the meeting on this, that we should uh, free up our witnesses and go back to work. Be it, this is ironic because we had three weeks, three weeks where we invited witnesses and for hours the witnesses sat there listening to the Conservatives filibuster. So look, uh, this isn't serious, this committee, honestly, hours and weeks of listening people talk about anything except the work of the committee. Mr. Blakey, you're saying that the Conservatives normally care about the salaries they earn and to respect that and do hard work for it. No. They have no regard for this salary because I did some calculations quickly. We wasted $200,000, taxpayers' dollars, for absolutely nothing. I, no, I think I have the right to speak, Mr. Lawrence. With the 60 hours that uh, you spoke, the interpreter regrets, but people can't speak at the same time. To wrap up quickly, I what Marcion. Uh, that my colleague is mentioning, I'm not sure that it's the right solution. I think that there are other things. We have to really carefully consider what we're going to do. Uh, He's not here. The, um, You're the, uh, the interpreter regrets, but she cannot interpret when there are two people speaking at the same time. No, members, no crosstalk. We cannot have crosstalk. Uh, MP Five Shuttel, minutes, please. Peter. Point of order. You have to interrupt. It's your job. Uh, MP Lawrence, you keep comment. your vault. Look at what you're doing again. Lawrence, listen. Your I job is to respect. Yeah, my job. There's a yoga room not far from here. Are you, MP Lawrence? I said it clearly. But you, not, but, but you do not have to scream. I said it clearly. I'm sorry okay. for my point, but my point of order was yeah, not your recognized. Your point of order is, what is your point of order, MP Lawrence? My, I was want to raise a point of order 
to ask for UC to, con to, to close this, to suspend this debate until Tuesday. That's, we have a mortgage a crisis here in Canada, that's not a point and of instead order. we're that talking about childish games. That is not a point of order, games. MP Lawrence. MP Chattel, please. You have the floor. Yes, Thank you. I'll continue, but I'm going to be quick because I also want to move on to the real business. I'm tired of this kind of attitude. So this committee has to work. We have important issues. We have important witnesses we need to hear from that we weren't able to hear from because of what the Conservatives did. Anyway, I want to work, and I want to work seriously, and I want to hear the witnesses. We have witnesses here. We. Right His mic we. is on. Yes. If, I, if they could stop interrupting me. Mr. Chair, I have a point. If he would like to let me continue. I did hear a point of order right now. Uh, MP point of order from, I think, well, it's MP Moran. Yes. Mr. Chair, I would like you to rule on whether or not Mr. Blakey's motion is actually in order. And the reason I'm asking you to, to rule on this is because I have in front of me the House of Commons Procedure and Practice 20 committees. It says, the role of vice chairs of committees serve as replacements, presiding over meetings when the chair is unable to attend. All the chair's powers can be delegated to the vice chair, but the vice chair cannot preside over a committee meeting while the office is vacant. My point is that none of the arguments that Mr. Uh, Blakey made in his presentation of the motion have anything to do with the only codified role of uh, vice chair, which is to fill in for you when you're un unavailable. So I don't think the motion is in order because none of the points he made has anything to do with the actual role of a vice chair. So I'd like you to make a ruling on whether or not Mr. Blakey's motion is in order. On the same point of order, yeah. on the same point of order, Mr. Chair. Same point of order. Mr. Morantz, of course, will know that I served notice of two motions on Tuesday, one uh, orally at committee and the other one in writing. The one that I've moved simply says that Vice Chair Halan no longer has the confidence of the Standing Committee on Finance and as a result that we proceed immediately to the election of a new vice chair from the official opposition. And I would politely disagree in that I think one of the main arguments that I just made, if Mr. Rantz had been listening, was that in order to fill in for the chair, the vice chair cannot be absent because there's no way, unless you're sitting at the committee table, either in person or virtually, for you to step in for the chair if the chair requires to be relieved. And so that speaks exactly to the formal role of the vice chair. So uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Morantz would like to tune in to the proceedings of the committee. Uh, Mr. Thank, Mr. Thank Chair, you, MP Blakey and MP Chair, on my on my point of order, um, I, I I hope that the language around this table remains respectful, and I do uh, think that asking me if I'm tuned in or not is quite quite okay. condescending. But in any event, um, the fact of the matter is that Mr. Hallan has only replaced you on one occasion where he acquitted himself very well. So that, Mr. That, just that one second. Now we're getting just, just one second. Let me just finish this one, Mr. We're, Chair. We're, we're, okay, quickly. One, one, quick last, one quick last point. Mr. Blakey knows all too well that in the absence of the first vice chair, there's a second and a third vice chair. Okay, who's we, are getting in, we are this getting in. Okay, thank you, MP Brands. We're suspending right now. I will confer with the clerk. I will get back to members. We are suspended.
Speaker. Sustain the chair. Mr. Beach. Sustain the chair. Madame Chatel. Sustain the chair. Ms. Zerowitz. Sustain. Mr. McDonald. I see Mr. McDonald as a thumbs up. Mr. Chambers. Thumbs down, Mr. Chambers. Mr. Halan. Overrule. Mr. Lawrence. Overrule. Mr. Morantz. Overrule. Mr. St. Marie. No. Mr. Blakey. Sustain. Yes, pour six, six, nays contre, five, cinq. Okay, sustained. So back to MP Chatel. The floor is yours. Miss. Thank you. And before beginning, I just want to check if we have the unanimous consent to allow the witnesses from the Department of Finance go back to work. It's very important work that they're doing for the country and for them so that this and this motion doesn't concern them really. So thank you very much. If we have UC to, re to release the officials, yeah, thank you very much, officials. Thank you. Napa, oh. you see. Terry, says no. Terry says no. No, there's not unanimous consent. Okay. Okay, sorry, I didn't catch. Uh, PS Beach said no. Okay, so officials uh, will stay. So, okay, continue, please. Uh, Désolé. I'm sorry. Look, just to sum up, I'm very, very disappointed in the work that we have not accomplished because of the Conservatives, the witnesses that we were not able to hear from because of the Conservatives, and the taxpayers' money that was invested in this that was lost because of the Conservatives. I hope that when we come back in September, this Finance Committee will do the work for which we are all paid to do. Thank you. Okay. I do have uh, P.S. Beach is on next. Then I've got uh, M.P. Lawrence, M.P. Baker, M.P. Zerowitz, M.P. Samari, M.P. Morantz, and M.P. Blakey. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And um, I'm going to say a few things. Um, and if we get to the end of this and if uh, we can retest uh, Sophie's idea. Um, but I wanted to say this first. Um, and it's just a few things. And I, I do acknowledge that there is a planning meeting on Tuesday. And um, I want us to get to a place where everyone um, can get into a good situation where we can go into that hoping that all of us are in a good place to improve that situation. Um, so let me just say a few things. Uh, I've had various conversations with our own members um, and with opposition members, all parties. The default filibuster obstructionist stance of the Pierre Polyev version of the conservatives uh, is actively and obviously hurting the work of this committee. And this motion is a direct result of that. Um, even members of the Conservative Party, I think, admit that we've seen an escalation of obstruction under the new leader of the opposition. And it's plain to see, and it's evidenced by, I mean, I'm not going to go into all of it because I already gave a 20-minute speech on that, um, but the unwillingness on multiple occasions not to negotiate in good faith, the desire to obstruct the work of the committee, and the will of the majority of the committee, as well as the actions that have played out over the last number of months. Um, negotiations with the Bloc and NDP always go reasonably well. I mean, they don't go perfectly. There's miscommunications, there's back and forth, um, but it would be exceptionally rare that once those discussions happen and there's an agreement that the positions would change. I mean, it took less than an hour to find a consensus with between government members and the opposition member, members outside of the conservatives, um, given once everybody had put kind of all their concerns on the table, whereas the conservatives spent weeks 
specifically making sure that we would never agree on terms. I mean, Jazz himself has stated multiple times that, you know, it's only been one filibuster and that we shouldn't set this precedent. I can already think of three times that there have been filibusters since Jazz has been the critic. Um, and there might be more that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Um, and there's no doubt that it's been worse under this leadership. Um, and that evidence would be could be gathered and would be indisputable by any objective measure. Um, the fact that the vice chair has caused some of these issues or has contributed to them, isn't necessarily aware of all the impacts of it or how many times it's happened is kind of the point of Mr. Blakey's motion. So while, while I was initially surprised by the motion, I, upon reflection, um, do understand where it's coming from. I would also suggest to my colleague, Mr. Halan, um, who I believe is actually a reasonable person and who I believe wants to work hard for his constituents, um, that there are a number of ways that he could demonstrate uh, and that the Conservative Party could demonstrate that they are willing to engage this committee in a professional way that would allow the committee to do its work while not giving up the ability to play a strong role as the critic for the official opposition. I think finding a way to get dates scheduled for meetings on the pre-budget consultations would be a good step. I think assuring that travel would actually happen, even though it's been canceled for the last two years, would be a good step. Um, I think providing like real terms for working on the fall economic statement, uh, the budget, you know, important fiscal documents would be a good a good step. And I think all of us can agree. And, and the start of this meeting is is proof of that that we need to spend less time debating the work that we're going to do and how we're going to do it and instead spend more time actually doing the work. And Daniel said that a few times, and I think that sentiment is shared by all of us at some level. And listen, I know that there are things that are outside of our members' control. There are discussions and decisions that happen outside of this committee, whether they be the standing orders, the chamber itself, think discussions that happen at the WHIP's office, the House Leader's offices, but certainly... The Conservatives Leader's Office shouldn't have to be consulted for every single decision on every single negotiation. We should be able to have a responsible decision because our discussion, because after all, this is an independent committee of MPs, or it's supposed to be. And as members of parliament, and I truly believe this, we have a duty to work together on legislation to make it better. There is good work that can be done here. Some of that good work was actually already happening today with regards to the mortgage study, by continuously filibustering legislation for no other person uh, purpose than to obstruct it, you actually hurt constituents, you hurt the legislation, you hurt the country, and you hurt the ability for us to do more studies like the one we're discussing today. And the BIA would have been better if you had contributed your ideas. And if you choose not to participate, fine, but you should allow the other opposition parties to contribute and debate their ideas as well. The quality of the decisions made at this table and in parliament directly correlate to the quality of the debate. And you do everyone a disservice by choosing not to engage in that debate. And you do damage our democracy by taking that right away from other members around this table. I've served on many committees before finance. And I've been happy to work with members to incorporate amendments from all parties. That includes the Conservatives, the Bloc, the NDP, and the Green Party. And I was happy to incorporate those amendments into legislation drafted by the government because they were good amendments and they were good ideas. So lastly, I'll say that I think there is a path forward, a positive path that can lead to a better place for all members of this committee, no matter which side of the House you sit on. But I also note that I'm not certain at this point that this motion will have a constructive impact on improving our working relationship, uh, especially given the fact that I'm not sure how blame should be distributed between individual members of the committee versus the actual leader of the Conservative Party. I would also note that we have witnesses here for a study we all agreed to spend the day working on, which is why I was not willing to support unanimous consent for them to be removed because I still feel like we could get back to that work today. So I know that there are members around the table. I was hoping to adjourn debate on this and go back to the, the witness study, to be honest with everybody there. And I still feel that I support that. 
but I do not want to take the right of my colleagues to be able to say what they want to say about this motion. So I'll just put on the record that I'm in favor of adjourning debate on this and going back to the mortgage study today. Um, but I want to make sure everybody has their, their time to say their piece as I've had my time to say my piece. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, uh, P.S. Beach. I will run. Merci beaucoup. Je vais suivre l'ordre de prise de parole. Nous passons à Monsieur Lawrence, Monsieur Baker, Sainte Marie, Blakey, Lawrence. Monsieur Lawrence, c'est à vous. Je propose de lever la séance. The question is to adjourn the debate on the motion of Mr. Blakey, Mr. Baker. No. Mr. Beach. No. Madame Châtel? No. Ms. Zerowitz? No. Mr. McDonald? Thumbs down, Mr. McDonald. Mr. Chambers? Is that a thumbs up? Sorry, I wasn't yes, sir. looking. Yes, okay. Uh, Mr. Halan? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Morans? Yes. Mr. Saint Marie? Oui. Mr. Blakey? No. Yes pour cinq, five, nays contre six, six. Thank you. I believe I have uh, still have the floor there, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, we can't hear you. Just a quick point of order. So, Clerk, I apologize. I did not get that vote count. The vote count was. Uh, Yes pour five cinq, nays contre six six. Okay, it's defeated. So we will continue. And uh, so, is the MP Lawrence? Just a quick, uh, just a quick point of order. I, I wonder if order. you might. I wonder if you might consult the clerk, uh, Mr. Chair. I think it's typical that after moving adjournment, a member loses the floor. Okay, we'll suspend here for a second. I'll confer with the clerk. Uh, MP Lawrence. MP Lawrence, yeah. Uh, thank you. And I would uh, welcome the member to tune in, as he said, to disrespectfully to my colleague to procedures. Point of order, Mr. Chair. A point of order. I would just like to be helpful to my colleague as we, we sent some notes, and I don't know if he's had time to check his text message, but I do support adjourning debate as long as my fellow Liberal colleagues have the ability to put their what I would assume would be short remarks onto the record okay that's not a point of order but thank ps beach thanks uh and i did get another I, uh mp chambers you want to be added to the list right the no. my understanding yes no i'll take okay. my name off okay your name is off and uh back to uh, mp lawrence uh, thank you, and uh, well, not a point of order. Very much appreciated uh, from Mr. Beach. Um, I will just very briefly put a couple of uh, remarks on order and then uh, hand it over to my Liberal colleagues, and uh, as long as they're brief, because we only have, what do we got, uh, 24 mo minutes left or so, uh, and like I said, this is an impending crisis, a ticking time bomb, as, as an article I'm looking at right now with respect to the mortgage market, and uh, it's sad that we have to put up with these childish games. Um, the uh, So this all started, if there's anyone who needs to be removed from their post, it's the Minister of Finance. She has, she has disregarded multiple invitations from this finance committee. Her sole job is to manage the finances and to report back to the Canadian people. We are the Canadian people's tool for her to express her expression. It's not the media, it's Parliament. That's why the Magna Carta was drafted. 800 plus years ago. That is why Parliament exists. And so she has flagrantly, flagrantly disregarded the invitations from this finance committee. Uh, if anyone, 
needs to be replaced desperately. It's the Minister of Finance. She has presided over the worst economy since the Great Depression. And all the people were asking for, the Canadian people, was for her to come and testify for two hours. But that was too much for her to climb down from her ivory white tower and to talk to the Canadian people, the common people. Instead, while we have an economy where the chairs riding, one in 20 are using the food bank, we have an obstructionist minister of finance who will not appear in front of this committee and who finally did to get her legislation brought and only showed up for an hour and a half, even though invited for two hours. Canadians, uh, conservatives worked hard to, to have a, a professional decorum, to improve the legislation. But no, we are not going to stand by and be a bystander as the worst economy since the Great Depression is presided over by this, by this liberal failure economy. And yes, you know what? It might be shocking to the other parties, but conservatives work as a team. Uh, we know right now that liberals are probably vying for their cabinet position uh, and that uh, perhaps they don't work as a team. Um, and uh, some are happy in the back benches. Um, uh, but as they, as they push and shove along to, uh, as the inevitable cabinet shuffle, we've seen this absolute failure in government. We saw in a recent poll, 80% of Canadians want a new government. 80%! 80%. That's, that's a huge number, especially considering that something like 30% of Canadians consider themselves liberals. Uh, so nearly a majority of liberal supporters want a new government. Um, and so while I see Mr. Blakey posing with this, with this liberal government for pictures and photo ops, um, and perhaps he wants to ingratiate himself too uh, in the new government. And, uh, and so it's, it's no wonder that these childish games are happening during uh, when, when the economy is falling apart, when their party is falling apart, perhaps they're lashing out like small children. Uh, it's, it's very disappointing. We have, an, we have a crisis coming. Uh, and you know what? I, like, way to, way to destroy and to poison the well. Uh, uh, like, you couldn't have done it any better, guys. So congratulations there. And you know what? It has nothing to do with Pierre Polyev, why we, why we don't support this budget. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the Canadian people. We have the worst, we have the worst economy since the Great Depression, guys. Like, uh, we've got a mortgage uh, time bomb. We've got officials here who want to talk, and instead, we've got to play childish political games. It's pathetic. It's sad. It's disappointing. And it is just an absolute embarrassment for this finance committee, an embarrassment. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to be a part of this committee. Uh, and if anyone should be removed, it's the chair here. The chair who's presided over a complete m dysfunction. Like, it couldn't get any worse. So, Daniel, if you want to remove someone, remove Peter, right? Re remove the Minister of Finance, who won't come for two hours despite multiple invitations there. So with that, I'll let you guys have your piece. Just a, just a quick point of order, Mr. Okay. Chair. A point of order? Uh, the last person to accuse me of childish games just two weeks ago was uh, Minister Freeland herself. I see Phil is taking his... Speaking direction from the minister. I think MP, that's not put of order, but thank you. And uh, off to MP Baker is next, then Zerowitz, somebody, Morantz, uh, Blakey. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'd like to start by, um, by thanking Daniel for bringing this forward. I think it's... Um, I think it's really important that we have this discussion, and, and I want to thank MP Beach for... Um, for, 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 for making sure that, that all the members that want to speak have a chance to have a, their word heard, their voices heard in this discussion. Um, I'll start by saying that I'm not going to repeat for the sake of time, but I, but I want to say I agree with the vast majority of what Mr. Blakey said in his opening. Um, I also want to say that you know, when I when I came, like I've been an elected official at, I've been I, I, I've been elected official for, for three and a half years federally, and I was a, for four years in the province of Ontario as a member of provincial parliament where I sat on the finance committee, and um, and I've like I've debated with members of all parties on a range of issues, um, and I've disagreed with folks on a lot of things, and I've seen. 
a range of arguments used. I've seen a range of tactics used. Um, but I've never seen something like this before, anything close to this before. And I think it's in all our interests, no matter which side of the aisle we're on, for it to stop. I just think it is. And, you know, when I remember when I came to this committee, um, I had a chat with, I think one of the first people to come to see me was Mr. Saint-Marie, to say hello, to dire bonjour. Um, on va travailler ensemble. Hello, we work together. We've done something very positive and optimistic in terms of our work together, and I appreciate that a great deal. I don't always agree with Mr. Saint-Marie, but uh, I feel that Mr. Saint-Marie tries and makes a very constructive contribution to this committee, and I greatly appreciate that. Blakey, early on in those first in that first meeting, when he came to this committee, and and I, 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 I the same, what I said about Mr. Saint-Marie, I would say about Mr. Blakey as well, and his contribution to this committee. We don't always agree on everything. Um, contrary to what the Conservatives would like people to believe. Um, but, but I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't harbor resentment that we disagree with each other. Um, when I, I had a chance to have similar conversations with our friends from the Conservatives. And, and those conversations were very similar as well. I look forward to working with you. Um, look forward to getting things done. I remember having conversations offline uh, with with members of the Conservative Caucus, uh, conserv Conservative Committee members over the course of the time I've been here. And with Mr. Halan, and with Mr. Chambers, and Mr. Lawrence, and Mr. Morantz. And I remember Mr. Halan telling me about, I won't talk about that on the record, but I will say, I remember Mr. Halan talking about his background, um, his work in, in his community over the course of years, and what led him to run for office. And I actually found that really, um, poignant and memorable. And Mr. Lawrence has shared similar comments with me. And I found, um, I found, for example, Mr. Chambers to be, you know, someone who's capable of conciliation uh, and compromise uh, and productive work across the aisle in a way that, that very, I think, I think he does so in, in a way that um, he's capable of that in a way that many members are not. And I think there's others around this table who are capable of that as well. But I think Mr. Chambers um, has done that over the, over the course of the last number of months. So I share that to say that my disappointment stems from the fact that whether you think the minister should appear for one hour or 30 minutes or two hours or 10 hours, whether you think the economy is doing well or not doing well, whether delinquencies are too high or they're not too high, whether we're doing enough to support Canadians or not support Canadians, no matter what you, your views are, um, you're entitled to them because you are here to do a job on behalf of your constituents to represent them. And how you do that and, and, and what their views are, I don't harbor resentment for any of that. <clears throat> I think what disappointed me the most was when when we see behavior, we see tactics, um, when we see personal attacks, when we see disruption for the sake of disruption, that that has nothing to do with the substance of the matter before us. It's not about whether the economy is performing well. It's not about whether interest rates are hurting people. And frankly, it's not about, it's not consistent with what the members that I've spoken about in the Conservative Caucus told me when I met them, when I got to know them, when they told me why they came to this place and why they came to, to run for office and represent their constituents. I don't want to use this intervention to beat up on anybody. That's not why I, I wanted to speak. I think, I think we all know what those things are, what happened to this committee, we were there. And I know we all get respective pressure from our respective leaders' offices. We all get it. Let's be frank. That's the system of government we're in. I think what I would say is, is that, Mr. Halan, I, like, I, Mr. Halan, I appeal to you. I ask you to remember that conversation that you shared with me as to why you ran for office and some of the work you've done in your community. 
I think what, what upset me the most about what happened here over the past few weeks wasn't that there were lots of reasons I was disappointed, but I think it wasn't even about the time we wasted. It wasn't about taking it to a new level. It wasn't about the rhetoric, although that was very upsetting. But what upset me the most was it wasn't consistent with what I thought, what I heard in those initial conversations about why we're here. And I, I didn't recognize the members who I thought I knew. And so I'm not here to beat up on people. What I'm here to say is anybody who wants to know what happened in this committee can go back to the record and they can listen and they can watch. But folks, I don't care if you're in opposition or in government or second party or third party or, or fourth party, it doesn't matter. Guys, folks, it hurts all of us when what happened over the past few weeks happens. And I, and I guess I would say I have great concerns about the tactics the Conservatives used. I do. And, I, and Mr. Halan is the lead of the Conservative team as the vice chair, as Mr. Blakey pointed out, and as the, as the finance critic. But I would ask us all to take this moment and just to reflect on why we're here. And I would ask us to just show respect for each other and, and for, this, for this place. Because when we go after each other personally, when we disrespect each other, we just, whether it's the chair or other members, it doesn't matter, then we harm our ability to do our job. And we harm our ability to serve our constituents. And we harm this place. We harm this institution's ability to serve our constituents. And it may feel good in the short run, like to score a hit, or to score a punch or get a sound bite or whatever it is. Or to appeal to a leader's office that's asking someone to do something that they probably shouldn't. But in the long run, it's hurting all of us and it's, and it's hurting our constituents. No matter, no matter what you think about how long the minister should be a committee or how well or badly the economy is doing or what the issues of the day are or what the solutions to those problems are. So. Um, I just ask us to all ask ourselves why we're here and how we, how we make the most of this opportunity. Thanks. Point of order, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, MP uh, Baker. Uh, who, point of order from? Terry Beach. Yeah, oh, PS Beach, yeah, point of order. Th thank you. Um, I think given the speaking list and given that we will not have time, I'd like to retest unanimous consent to dismiss the officials at this time. All right, I'm looking to members, UC, to allow officials to be released. Yes. Okay, I see. Yep, thumbs up from everybody. Officials, thank you so much uh, for being with us. The testimony that you did provide was uh, excellent. And I know uh, with to the members' questions, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. Uh, thank you also, MP Baker. Uh, and uh, I've got next on my list, I have uh, MP Zerowitz. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I want to say, start off just by saying I agree with the comments of uh, my colleague Sophie, Terry, and Yvonne. Um, and I also, too, want to say uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Blakey for putting forward this motion uh, because I, too, feel uh, one, I, I do largely agree with uh, many of the points that he had mentioned, but I also think it's important for us to discuss what's happened over the last few weeks in the hopes that we can get to a better place. Um, I too found what, what, what happened was unacceptable. It was a waste of time for you. Uh, it was a t waste of time for me, for us, and it was a waste of money for Canadians. Uh, we have made a mockery of uh, what the work that this committee is meant to do. We've made a mockery of what the House of Commons stands for and the work it's supposed to do. And we did not honour uh, what Canadians have elected us to do, which is to work together, uh, to address the issues of the day, and to create a better country. Uh, so I don't know how, to be honest, I asked my colleagues, how many hours did we, was the filibuster on? We have no clue. It's anywhere between 40 and 60 hours. In any case, it was a colossal waste of time. Uh, the main crux of the initial part of the filibuster was about having the Minister of Finance come. Even after she had agreed to come, even after she was on record to come, and she was scheduled to come, the filibuster still continued. 
there was uh, incorrect information that kept on being portrayed that she had not come before, no matter how many times we had invited. Uh, she had already come three times before, and her coming that time for this BIA, BIA made it a fourth time. And there is no minister that comes every single time a committee asks. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's the finance ministry or any ministry. Um, then uh, we, there was the filibuster continued in order to have witnesses um, uh, come. But the filibuster took so long that we literally eliminated all opportunities for witnesses to actually come before us to talk to us about the BIA, what was good, what was bad, what could be improved. And so that did not make it uh, possible. I would also like to suggest that we have to stop with the performance politics, uh, which, is, which we see very, very prevalent, and I would say most specifically from our conservative colleagues. And I'll, we heard, we saw it two minutes ago. Uh, the, there's a lot of invention that goes on. There is a mortgage time bomb, apparently, which is not the case. We heard very clearly today that the delinquency rate for mortgages remain very low, below uh, what we saw pre-pandemic. It's at 0 0.12. We heard that household finances are relatively healthy. We heard about all the tools are in place that actually are protecting Canadians, including the mortgage stress tests that was put into place in February 2020. And we've heard that the high level of debt that Canadians have, a big portion of that is mortgage debt. So that is complete invention that there is a mortgage time bomb. It is also complete invention that we are in the worst economy. There's literally no economist that would agree with that in the world. We consistently are among the top in terms of growth rates. We are, we are consistent in the top in terms of uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio, in terms of uh, uh, employment rates, in terms of outlook, uh, and in terms of projections moving forward. So complete nonsense. So I'm going to end by saying let's do better. Let's find a way uh, to work together to do what it is that Canadians have asked us to do. And I think with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the debate be now adjourned. No. I think there's a vote. Is there not? Yeah, there is a, there is a vote. We do have to go to vote. Okay, clerk. Ms. Mr. Baker. In favor. Mr. Beach. In favor. Madame Chatel. En favor. Ms. Zerowitz. Uh, in favor. Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald, thumbs up. Mr. Chambers. No. Mr. Halan. No. Mr. Lawrence. No. Mr. Morantz. No. Mr. St. Marie? No. Mr. Blakey? No. Yes, pour 5 5. Nays, contre 6 6. Okay, so we, uh, we continue. So, uh, MP Zerowitz. Oh, oh, I finished because, you know, I. Okay, devote, yeah, so okay, to go to so the next we're one. moving on. Oh, wait, I've got uh, MP St. Marie next. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I just want to say that I voted against uh, the ending the debate now because there are a few people left on the list, whereas more most of the members have spoken. In the beginning, when it was suggested, I thought, yes, I would have preferred that we continue asking our questions of the witnesses and have that debate. But now, because everyone else has spoken, and I don't think it'd be fair to interrupt a debate and uh, not get to the bottom of this. This motion would perhaps have allowed us to have a debate and uh, speak about the uneasiness here in the committee. So first of all, I want to say from the bottom of my heart that I have the greatest respect for each and every member of this committee, the chair, all the members from every party. I have deep respect for all of you. You do a remarkable job and together we are able to have really good constructive debates when that's possible. So. 
there's nothing in that I will say that is personal. Uh, I'm not bitter against, I'm not against anyone, and I greatly appreciate the committee, even if there are committees where there are arguments, as we have seen recently. Which brings me to talk about the filibuster. I understand, Daniel, I understand Sophie and the Liberal colleagues for being so frustrated after those many, many hours of filibustering where rather than uh, studying the uh, omnibus bill, five, six hundred pages, where if we had done a normal study, we could have improved it. And now uh, we've heard about uh, baby eels um, oh, several times, and I also was frustrated by that. It is frustrating, except that I want to remind my colleagues that the filibuster, to my knowledge, in all par parliaments of democracies is a tool that's there and that's used. And it can take different forms, but it is used for a reason. I understand that it's frustrating. The goal of these dilatory motions and filibusters is to say to the other parties and to the government, listen, you're not respecting me. And so I'm going to throw a spanner in the works. So it's normal that it be unpleasant and that it would create so much frustration. So to my knowledge, I don't have uh, an extraordinary knowledge of the history of the Parliament of Canada and the Anglophone countries in the world that have such parliaments. But when parties are in opposition, whether they're the Liberals, the NDP from 2011 to 2015, for example, they did filibusters. And I think uh, Peter Julian uh, brags about that sometimes. It was very unpleasant for the government at the time. The Liberals in opposition were able to do so as well. So when I uh, find myself in a filibuster, I'm frustrated. It stops us from doing other things. At the same time, I do have a respect for a, a filibuster because it's a way of challenging. It's a way of slowing down the work, and it's a way of making the government do something else. And if it wasn't that, what would it be? Would, 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 we, would we get to fisticuffs? Uh, what, it's, it's a way of opposing what's happening. But there's a point in the filibuster where I was really angry. One member came and replaced another member. He took his telephone and he put the television that was on in, of what was happening in the house and put it to the microphone. That could really damage our interpreter's hearing, and that is really against the rules. I was really angry about that. But for the rest of it, filibusters and all parliaments, all parties that find themselves in opposition will use it. There's always the other side of the coin. Conservatives said they wanted the minister for two hours. Was that justified or not? Well, I'm not really satisfied with her appearance when she came, and I didn't feel that she really had a good handle on that omnibus bill. I was disappointed. So, uh, Danielle, the th congratulations for having gotten that time at least. But I think that every elected member is not in a position to say uh, of the other members or one party to the other how they should behave. This is democracy. We are responsible to our electors, our constituents. And uh, if if my mem constituents in Joliet said you've got too long, too much of a filibuster, we'll vote you out. But what do I have to say to a member from Calgary? We have common points that we share, but we represent very different realities. We're often going to vote in different ways on bills, but I have great respect because I know that he represents his people, and that's what he feels he needs to do when he's make, doing a filibuster. When he's filibustering, he's doing this, and he is accountable to his constituents, not to the people here. So that's for, for the filibuster. It's frustrating. It's intended to be frustrating, and all parties use it when they're in opposition. So yes, if we could find a different way of working together, so much the better. But if not, these are the rules of the House. And that brings me to the standing orders. To my knowledge, the uh, custom is that the first vice chair is the party in, it was the official from the party of the official opposition. So if we say that the members of the other parties are now going to say to the party that elected their vice chair how to behave themselves, I think that that is a dangerous precedent that I would wish to avoid. I understand that with the frustrations that we can all experience, we're doing this to force the debate. That could be positive. But if ever the clerk said to us, I mean, he said the clerk that this has never been done. This is a precedent. And I worry about precedents. We're talking about a motion in the House to change the standing orders 
serious changes to the standing orders should be done through consensus. And uh, this is the first, apparently, that it would not be done so. And that's really a worrisome precedent for me as well, because any government can do that after. When there's another party that uh, is in the majority in a committee, they can gag the opposition through changes in, in rules. So I fear these kinds of changes. And of course, I wouldn't want to change the rules in that regard here. Two final points that I'd like, like to raise. I'm trying to go quickly. As I was saying, in the House, we're changing the standing orders in a non-consensual fashion, and that's a dangerous precedent. If this motion was adopted here, as the clerk was saying, that would be a first as well, which would create another precedent, which worries me a great deal. I understand that we can have uh, fundamental debates on how we work here, but I don't want us to create any new precedents. And I'll wrap up with a final point that uh, leaves me very ill at ease. Daniel, for whom I have the greatest respect, reminded us of who, sorry, before getting to that, Peter is doing a super job. He's never replaced. I haven't shared once. The one time he called me, when Jazz replaced him, if ever there was a problem, I, would I be prepared to take it on? But Peter's always there. Jazz, the one time that he replaced him, did a remarkable job. So I understand that this is the right way of doing things. Uh, perhaps he's less, been less present than he should be. But it's important for me that the Conservatives, who are the official comp opposition, continue to appoint their own vice chair. When Jazz did chair the meeting. He did a remarkable job, in my opinion. And the, the uncomfortable point I wanted to raise is that when looking around the table, there's one racialized person at the table, and that is the person who we are actually targeting right now. That makes me very uncomfortable. And so I will uh, wrap up uh, my comments on that point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, merci, uh, MP. Thank you. And I have uh, MP Blakey, uh, MP Alan, PS Beach. MP Blakey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would just weigh in to say, and I, you know, I appreciate folks sounding off about the filibuster and the nature of it. And as I say, I mean, during that process, I, I commented on what I thought about the objectives of the of the filibuster. In fact, agreed with some of them. Um, that's not what this is about. What this is about is the role of vice chair on committee, and the fact that we went through a long process. Who, and the person that is paid $6,600 every year to be here, to be able to relieve the chair, and I think also perform some other important informal duties, left it to somebody else to do those informal duties and wasn't present during those uh, proceedings. And that's really what's at issue. And I shared some information about that. I, I do think when we talk about larger context, I mean, we, we've got an official opposition right now who's, you know, whose leader has held a number of press conferences to say that he wants to make how much MPs show up to work an issue, that he wants Parliament to sit through the summer, that he wants committees to sit through the summer, and his right-hand man on the Finance Committee isn't showing up in regular season. So it's the leader of the official opposition that has made this such uh, a relevant issue by insisting on uh, the idea that MPs should be instead of doing the work that we all have to do during the summer in our ridings, uh, showing up here in Ottawa to do, to do more kinds of work here, although we've seen that sometimes that work can end up actually just meaning listening to conservatives sound off. So the question is, you know, if the, if the relevant political issue of the day, as per the leader of the official opposition, is MP showing up to work, and we just went through an over 40-hour study of the Budget Implementation Act, where his main person on the file despite having a paid obligation to the to the committee wasn't coming how serious we should really take those things and i'm hearing from the committee that you know i think there's a lot of goodwill around the table and a willingness um, to put this debate as, uh, aside but i want conservatives to know that if they want to continue to make issues like this an issue that there's a number of us that are going to have a lot to say and they're not going to like everything that they have to hear or that uh, or they're not going to like to hear everything, certainly, that I have to say and that others may. So there are different ways of going about our business here. 
But if the conservatives want to have their cake and eat it too, accuse folks of not showing up to work while, they're them, while they themselves are not doing that, while accepting a paycheck for it, then we're going to have words about it. If we want to conduct our business otherwise in a more understanding way, with uh, parties trying to figure that out and not play the politics of calling out, so be it. But I'm tired of being the reasonable person in the room and having that be taken advantage of for people to try and score political points against me as I watch them do the very things themselves that they criticize. So I'm not prepared to tolerate that kind of hypocrisy anymore. That's a warning for folks that want to continue to carry themselves on in that way. If we want to have a race to the bottom, we will get there. That's not the way I prefer to do politics. I think I've demonstrated that many times around this table. But I think if that's the way it's going to go, then that's where I'll end up, along with everybody else. So why don't we find a different way of doing things? But I think in order to do that, we need some leadership, and that should come from the people that are paid to do that job of leadership on this committee. Thank you. Thank you, uh, MP Blakey. I've got uh, MP Halan and then PS Speech. Thanks, Chair. Um, since this motion is about me, I thought it'd be fair for me to get my own thoughts on the record as well. Um, so, you know, we, we talk about things not being personal, but, you know, I don't see anyone else's name on the motion. So uh, I'd just like to say my piece. I'll start off by saying first that there's no hard feelings after this whole thing. I think we all understand the business. We understand that we can move forward after this. There will be no hard feelings, especially from my end, after this whole ordeal uh, comes to an end. But I did want to touch on a few points that Mr. Blakey brought up. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll start off by some of the points that Mr. Baker brought up first about, um, about why I'm here. Um, someone with my past should honestly not even be in this position today. I didn't come here um, to this country knowing that I would be here in this position today. Um, with my growing up, I, this is not something that I even would have had a chance to do the way that I grew up, especially in my riding. I get to represent a lot of people that are low income, a lot of new immigrants, who try to live that Canadian dream, what my parents came here to do, a better future for me. But that wasn't easy. I look around the room, and I don't see anyone that looks like me around in this room. This position that I have been given this responsibility of, not many people get this, get this opportunity. And for me, that's a big deal. When I'm traveling the country, which obviously I'm doing a lot, we're doing a lot of outreach, I do hear from different ethnic communities that it's a sense of pride to be able to see that someone that doesn't normally fit the description of a politician in this role. And people are, take that as a sense of pride. I recently just was in, um, in Brampton and talking to those international students trying to stop their deportations. I put myself in their shoes. We were successful in helping to stop those deportations because that is another part of my role. I represent not just my own community, I represent many different communities. I have almost 108 languages spoken in my writing alone. So when I come to this job every single day when I wake up, I remember who I represent every single day. Whether I'm here or traveling the country. But one thing I did learn growing up was the importance of a team and leadership. So what I want to address to Mr. Blakely, straight looking at you right now, is that what I learned was the best form of leadership is to empower people. We work as a team on this side. I didn't give up my obligations. Rather, I split them up because I love to see other people be in a leadership role. That's, that's the values that I learned growing up. I was very fortunate enough, I grew up as an at-risk youth myself. Growing up, I was very fortunate enough with the opportunities that this country gave me and my family and, and the blessings of God to be able to help other at-risk youth. We opened up an after-school program for at-risk youth. 
And what we used to do there is to make sure, especially the young women that came to us, we would hold these sports tournaments every month, whether it was basketball, whether it was dodgeball, volleyball, whatever the sport. The whole point of running those wasn't to raise money. It's not hard for a couple of us to get together and raise $5,000 for a charity. That wasn't the point. The whole point of those tournaments was to put those young women in leadership roles that may not have had that opportunity otherwise. To put encouragement inside them and build confidence inside of them that it's not just us that can do this job, they can do that too. I carry that same principle when I come to this, this parliament and outside. Because I want others to know that if I can do this, anyone can do this. It doesn't matter about your background. The thing that really bothers me is that, and this is something that I don't think conservatives would ever do, is equate someone's work ethic to how much they're being paid. I don't find that particularly any type of uh, putting politics aside even to accuse someone of not being able to earn their paycheck. We wouldn't do that normally outside. It's not something we do in business. It's none of our business actually. Because there are other roles and responsibilities we play. And I'll give you an example of, of on my end what happens. I don't just do casework in my own community for Calgary Forest Lawn. 80% of my casework is from outside of my community, is outside of my riding. And I, I do it with a, with a smile on my face. And I want to thank my, my team that step up every single day and never ask, where are you from? You should go to that MP. We say, okay, we'll do it. And when the whole process started with the BIA, we had a huge lineup of people from our team that said, we, need, we want to get on the record and represent our constituents. I was the first one to say, well, they can take my spot. That was the whole point. And I think we're setting a really, really bad precedent in here. You, you want to get rid of me. Like, huh? I'm sure there's a lot of people in Parliament that want to get rid of me, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'm not here to make friends. I'm not, I'm not here to be M M that M nice guy. And, and, and I apologize for interrupting. Oh. I just want to let members know I'm trying, I'm, we're adding some extra resources to see if we just to I'm going to wrap up in more, one minute. More, just more, more, more time going, just so that you know you have, the, okay. you have time. I'm going okay, to wrap up quickly. Clark, I, don't, I don't want to drag this on, but I just wanted to make sure that I would get on record saying that we all know we have more than a responsibility of just being on this hill. I want to see more people like me and others that come to this country doing this. And I think being put in this role that... Obviously, we know our leader was known for this role. And for that to be handed to me was, it was a big deal for me, my family, and many people across this country, because that's what I hear about. I honestly did not have a family that I came from that was political or even successful. We, we lived through poverty. Like, I remember standing in line for, like for, for low-income bus passes in my riding. And I remember growing up, the first bout of racism, and I'm not, I'm not going to say that that's what this is about, but I just want to know, like, I want to put on record how important this being here is for me. That my first experience with racism was being on a bus with my mom and my brother, and being, she got spat on because she covered her head. Oh my God. And after that, it really put inside, and there was many different other insta instances as well, whether it was going through school, whether it was playing sports, and even in business. I would look around the table, and this would be the exact same dynamic of what the table looked like. I would be the person that looked much different than everybody else. But I knew I had a role to play. And I'm not going to play the victim card. This isn't about racism. I'm just saying that people of other ethnicities, when I travel... Tell me how proud they are that I get to be in this position. And I, and I don't take it lightly. But what I think this precedence is setting is that if you come here and you do your job, whether you do it good or not, you know, that's, that's very, very ob objective, like uh, subjective of, of the person looking at it. But at the end of the day, it, it does go to show that you could be your best, try your best, but there'll be always someone that wants to get rid of you. 
And that's what I'm scared of the precedents that we're setting when we go down this line. That's what I wanted to, that's my heartfelt plea to the committee. I'm not, there's no bad feelings after this. I just wished, Daniel, that instead of bringing it on this floor, we would, we would have uh, the decency of maybe having this conversation once at least outside of here. Because I'm not hard to get a hold of. I get, I, people call me all the time. So going forward, however the committee wants to do this, I'm, I'm all game. But I, I don't think I'll back down from doing the job that I was sent here to do. I don't think that would be the point of me being here then. So I just want to thank the committee. Thank you for everyone's input. And I'll leave my piece there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, MP Helen. I do have limited resources, but PS Beach, and then we gotta we have to wrap up. Thirty seconds, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank everyone for having a very frank conversation. I want to thank individuals, especially the last speaker who spoke from a point of uh, vulnerability, which I think is good. Uh, I would suggest, given that we have a planning meeting in camera on Tuesday, that all members think about the points that they agree with that were discussed today from all members. Don't go looking for the things you disagree with. And I would suggest that all of us leave our swords and our shields at the door on Tuesday. And uh, it's an opportunity for us to get some good productive work done. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would move that we adjourn debate. Okay, there's a move to adjourn debate. Uh, members, clerk. Is it move to adjourn debate or move to adjourn the meeting, Mr. Beach? Move to adjourn debate, and then I hope we will adjourn to the, the meeting. Mr. Baker? In favor. Mr. Beach? In favor. Madame Chatel? En favor. Ms. Derwitz? In favor. Mr. McDonald? Thumbs up. Mr. Chambers? Oui. Mr. Helan? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Morantz? Yes. Monsieur Saint Marie? Oui. Mr. Blakey? No. Yes, pour 10. Ten. Nays contre 11. Onze. Okay, we've adjourned debate. Sorry, on uh, again, motion. one contre un, not 11. Oui. Yeah, okay. So we've adjourned debate. Uh, PS Beach? Oh, my hand. I put my hand down. I, I think we okay, should. So members. Yes. Yeah, so we've uh, we've exhausted resources. Uh, thank you, members. And uh, so we are now adjourned. Thank you.